Okay, so welcome everybody for our uh, weekly seminar series. Uh, today at the Department of Marine Geosciences at the University of Haifa. Today we are very much honored to host uh, um, Dr. Uh, Lydia Atieno Olaka from the University of Nairobi in Kenya. Lydia holds a B, uh, BSc from the University of uh, Nairobi in geology and also a master's in environmental geology from the same university from 2005. Then Lydia uh, traveled to Potsdam University in Germany to obtain a PhD in geosciences, in, uh, which uh, she graduated in 2011 with a thesis titled Hydro Hydrology Across Scales, Sensitivity of East African Rift Lakes to Climate Change. Then she pursued a postdoc fellowship funded by the Volkswagen Foundation on studying groundwater dynamics and contaminant evolution in the central Kenyan rift, which was held between 2012 and 2022. Uh, she also got a US UCSF funding to study impact of outdoor pollution on pre pretermined outcomes in Migori in 2017. So we are very much honored to uh, host uh, Lydia in which she is going to talk today about geology and health in Kenya. So Lydia, the podium is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nicolas, for the invitation and the introduction. So just give me a second to start this. So uh, I think it's taking a while, yeah, now we have it. Uh, <clears throat> so um, um, my name is Lydia Olaka, as you've heard. I am in the Department of Arts and, Art and Climate Sciences. It was formerly Department of Geology at the University of Nairobi, but I also have uh, affiliation to the Geology Department at uh, Technical University of Kenya. And the topic I have for you today is uh, an ongoing work that I've been doing. It's titled Geology and Health in Kenya. And uh, I start off with just some of the pictures from the areas that I've been working on and uh, which somehow led me to get uh, to be very interested in this uh, particular topic. So as you've been told, um, I, Okay, uh, let me just uh, get the, ah, okay. Uh, so um, my research, uh, basically during my PhD, I was looking at paleo reconstruction of East African lakes. And so when you see the, uh, as you see in the figure below, um, the one on the right is at the lakes. The entire figure is all the lakes of the East African rift from uh, Ethiopia to Kenya. And my focus was from the Ethiopian plateau down to um, the uh, Southern Kenya Rift and also into Tanzania. And during that time, I was looking at the lake level fluctuations during the Holocene. So the idea was to look at all the lakes and see how they vary um, um, with different climatic uh, phenomena. So what exactly is causing the lakes to rise and also to maintain? Is it only climate or what? But then from it, we were able to find that there are a couple of factors. And uh, we looked at the topography and also the regional climate of the area and the interconnectivity of um, the lake. So this was the main finding from there. And as I was studying this, I realized that groundwater was a major component of uh, connecting these particular lakes. And it, it was one of the understudied um, uh, topic to be able to understand the climate of um, 
the East African Rift. So uh, from that, then uh, I was fortunate enough to get the, um, a postdoc fellowship funded by the Volkswagen Foundation uh, to look at climate change or the impact of climate on the groundwater uh, during this uh, the recent time period. And I've been fortunate enough to get different grants from the Volkswagen to study different components of the groundwater uh, flow dynamics and also contamination within the rift for the last uh, 10 or so years. And as I was uh, studying the, this, um, studying groundwater, you have to work with the community. So you have to work with the well owners. And every time I went to collect the water, they would ask, what is the health impact? Do you think it is good for my health and things like this? But coming from a geology point of view or perspective, I was not used to this kind of interaction with humans or with people or society. And so I realized that this is a very good component in that because I understand the geology and the flow and how the quality arises, then um, it would be good to co collaborate with either people from health or try and understand um, some of these health aspects that are connected with geology. And this is uh, not very far because if you look at the periodic table, we know that there are certain elements that are essential to humans and those that are non-essential. So when we look at this particular periodic table, the very uh, gray ones are those that are essential. And then you have the, the dark gray, which is toxic, yeah? So some of the elements that we need for body function, for humans or animals, for example, we, we need uh, uh, the carbon, oxygen, uh, sulfur, sodium, calcium, potassium, yeah? But then others, we need, uh, when you look at the ones that have light gray and dark gray, these ones are needed in a, such a narrow range. If it is low, there's a problem, yeah? And if it is high, there's also a problem. So, and how are humans, uh, how do the people get this? Basically, uh, people get the essential elements that they need or even the toxic ones through interaction with the environment. It comes from the foods that we eat. It comes from the animals which have also eaten the crops that grow uh, in the soil that uh, is there. And the soil is also leaching uh, out certain elements which then concentrate in the water. And this is very important, especially for communities that rely on their environment to obtain everything. Yeah. So especially rural environments, they grow their own crops near their home. The water they get is either from a well or a river from the region. So they are exposed. So if we have any element that is in excess um, in, the, in the rocks, it will enrich in the water. It might also be enriched in the soil and in the plants. So in the end, people might be um, exposed or people are going to be exposed to um, excesses. Or the other way is if we have rocks that have less um, of the essential nutrients, then there's going to be a deficiency. So this is something which has been noted um, for a while now and there's a growing field that is called medical geology which is basically interested in the health aspects that are connected to the geology of an area yeah and traditionally when the medical research is done especially here in kenya the uh, summaries are done per, per um, administrative unit you know, so it will be the county, the, the location or whatever. But when we do that, we miss out the component of geology. So the interest here is to look at these particular cases that occur and are connected to the space, space or the spatial distribution of the rocks or the elements of uh, that area. So this is just showing us again, something that I mentioned before that uh, we have um, two cases, yeah? So the left one, left-hand side is a case where we have an essential 
element. So what happens? The x axis here basically shows us the concentration increasing and uh, the y axis is either yield or a growth. So if we have an essential element like copper or zinc in low uh, concentration and some concentration here, if it uh, the below that the animal person or plant will be deficient yeah but then we have an optimal level that is required for the body for proper body function hormonal growth etc etc and beyond that like for example copper and zinc it becomes toxic so beyond a certain number here it becomes toxic and after that it is actually and uh, lethal. So continued increase of that particular element becomes toxic. The other case where we have the non-essential, people will be exposed to it or an animal will be exposed to it. It's tolerable for a while and then beyond a certain threshold, then it is toxic, yeah? So this usually um, it really depends on the element and um, also there are many other factors. So this is only the geology bit that I'm talking about, but of course this is um, dependent upon a lot of things. Yeah, the sex of the person, the genetics of the, part of the people, uh, their work, whether they are exposed there all the whole time or they move and things like that. So the, this uh, work, which is basically medical geology, uh, there's been pioneering works which have been identified, as I mentioned, that there are health problems which are related to place. And this is based on the, uh, the inorganic elements that people are exposed to, an excess, a deficiency sometimes, or even an imbalance of these inorganic elements, which originate from geological sources, will affect the human or animal well being directly or indirectly. And the more as geologists continue to exploit the earth for mineral resources since the 17th century, this has led to release of a lot of toxic elements within the environment. And some of these uh, medical work studies have been done, especially in Kenya, uh, Professor T.C. Davis was the pioneer of this particular topic in Kenya since 1990s and has identified a number of toxicities and deficiencies. So in the next couple of uh, slides, I'm just going to tell you um, some of the studies that I've done uh, parallel to the uh, postdoc work that I've been uh, doing. So um, he, uh, wait, 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 okay. Geology of Kenya. Uh, okay. So on the extreme left, you can see the geological map of Kenya. This is a quite a, a summarized, a generalized map uh, of Kenya. Uh, what I want you to take from here is that when we look at the um, uh, map of Kenya, the oldest rocks which are Kian are more or less on the extreme um, western side. So that's uh, the oldest uh, granitic intrusions in there and so many other. This is also the area where there's gold mining and stuff. And then um, we also have the, uh, the orange formations here, the dark orange, so first of all, let me see this in the middle here is the rift. So the green bit, eh? yeah. But either side of it, we have this orange formation. So these are the met metamorphic proterozoic rocks, which actually um, are being pushed, uh, sep uh, pushed away or as the extension in the rift is happening. Yeah, so from the suture zone, then uh, the volcanics are filling in uh, within the rift and the metamorphic rocks are on the on either side of it. Then we also have these uh, Jurassic rocks or um, Cretaceous rocks around the coast area. So that's the purple bluish formation. And we also have some in the Northern part of Kenya. And then we have uh, the uh, sediments 
which we can see there are some certain uh, recent sediments which are yellowish in color. And then in the middle, we have the uh, rift. So this is just general geology where we have the rift is also where we have the new volcanic rocks uh, being deposited. It's also the area which is characterized by um, uh, geothermal activity. So there's a high geothermal gradient there and the area where I've also spent some time uh, trying to study and uh, understand. And um, with the different rocks, we have different elements which are enriched in one way or another. Other places we also have deficiencies as a result of that. And the other thing which we also have to remember is that a lot of people or um, groundwater is also a main source of water supply within Kenya because um, two thirds of Kenya is arid. So on the, all this area where we have the orange formations all the way to the Eastern side and to the North is, is arid. So two thirds of Kenya is arid, meaning the source of water is from the groundwater. And remember that <clears throat> the um, groundwater has interaction with the different rocks. So, and it's one of the uh, pathways of uh, getting the uh, elements or the inorganic elements. So I'm going to give you like generally three areas that I've studied and just looking at uh, the geology there and some of the health <clears throat> issues that are coming up. Some have been studied by others and uh, others have not. So when you look at the beautiful Rift Valley, uh, which is Cenozoic, about uh, started in Ethiopia as extension is, ex uh, is continuing southwards, um, started around uh, 17 million years within um, Northern Kenya and uh, continuing further south. We have a lot of, uh, th there are volcanoes in there. There's also, um, most of these volcanic rocks are per al alkaline. So we have high silica in them, uh, high sodium, potassium, very um, low in calcium. And then we have a number of rocks of different formations laid uh, there. We have rhyolites, comendites, basalts, phonolites, all uh, different kinds. It is also characterized by high uh, fluoride or fluorine within the minerals. We also have radon gas, which has been reported in certain areas. And then of course, um, as much as it has the, because it has the high geothermal gradient of about 200 degrees per kilo, uh, centigrade per kilometer, we have the uh, geothermal development in the area. So uh, as the picture you see on the, up there on the right is uh, from, one of the geothermal uh, production power plants. And that is just steam being released uh, to, vent, to vent out. So what is this, the study that I did here, um, look on the uh, figure to the right. The figure to the right shows you the dot, blue dots and the blue dots are the groundwater samples that we collected from the, this area, I think about uh, 60 or so. Then there's also some orange stars, which show you the rocks, which we collected from the area. And the idea was to try and understand uh, um, the concentrations of various elements. The left-hand side is basically where we see the uh, geology. On the, uh, where we have Lake Naivasha at the bottom, that's the rift floor, and uh, we have the escarpments. So around the rift floor, as you can see, we see this yellowish unit, which is basically lacustrine sediments. And these lacustrine sediments are also um, the areas where we had the um, Holocene high lake level. So the lake was larger, much larger than it is now and uh, covering this entire area. It was about 120 meters high, uh, about uh, 10,000 years ago. And 
these uh, sediments are also the most productive um, aquifers. So there's quite a lot of, if you look at the distribution of boreholes, you'll find that most of them are actually within the, the, the rift flow uh, that we uh, collected. Um, the characteristics of the rocks, look at the Piper diagram on the right. And what you see is that we have uh, most, most of the, the, so the yellowish units or the yellowish colored dots are rivers. The red is the boreholes and the blue are the lakes. You can see they are quite distributed. If we start with the cut ions at the bottom, sodium plus uh, potassium, K plus Na, uh, we have uh, most of the waters are characterized as having high potassium and sodium, or mainly being Ka plus, K plus Na rich. And as you can see, we have very low calcium within uh, the waters. And then there are also high bicarbonate. So uh, high in bicarbonate, a little bit low in the sulfates and also the chloride and nitrate. So that characterizes the groundwater in this particular place. From the rocks that we analyzed, we found quite a high range of um, fluoride concentration or fluorine concentration. And this range from 206 to about 6,000 um, uh, ppm within, and we identify minerals such as cordierite, muscovite, vilamite, and also apatite, which have high uh, fluoride. I've mentioned about the hydrochemistry, just to mention that they are cal the waters are low in calcium. And the other thing is that we also have high pH. So most of the waters are seven and around seven and above, especially when it comes to groundwater, seven to around eight. And we identify that the processes which uh, uh, concentrate the fluoride are basically uh, dissolution of the hyperalkaline volcanic rocks that we have there, cation exchange, and competitive anions which contribute to the fluoride. This area has a high incidence of dental and skeletal fluorosis. Uh, Maybe let me go down here and then come back. Um, so the figure on the right hand side, extreme right, shows us the different groundwater. I mean, we correct, collected groundwater, lake water, and also rivers. And the y-axis, so the red line that you're seeing there is basically um, showing the WHO recommended limit of fluoride in uh, water because fluoride is one of the essential elements that is required in a small quantity to be able to get uh, good teeth. It's put in toothpaste and all that, yeah? So the range of uh, up to 1.5 is recommended, but above that, then it causes some health issues. And as you can see from the samples which we got, um, most of the groundwater actually are all in the, uh, all the groundwater are, um, have a high fluoride concentration, yeah. And um, some of the rainwater, some of it also, we actually found uh, uh, river water, sorry, RW, the river water, some rivers had lower fluoride concentrations, but others also had high uh, fluoride concentrations. So, and the two figures you see GW repeated, uh, seems like I missed a label here. One was from the rainy season, which is on the left. And then the darker gray ones were from the wet season. So the same boreholes uh, collected twice, just to see how the levels uh, change between the different uh, seasons. Okay. And um, from these, um, uh, I think, uh, yeah, the cases uh, that you see, this is also from one of my former uh, master students. And what they found is that 
there was ve there was very high um, cases of dental fluorosis from about 100 or so patients which were uh, the which were admitted uh, well who went to a certain hospital um, the idea was to because we did not quite get consent from um, the locals it was such a short time the idea was to go and get the cases of dental fluorosis for which have been reported in hospital yeah so that we see how prevalent is it in this particular area so in that place they found that there are two clinics here uh, the first one shows uh, up here uh, in St. Mary's, which shows um, mild to mod moderate fluorosis at 54% and severe cases were at uh, 32%. This is for the adults. And then the prevalence for the under 14, yeah, uh, because you know fluoride, uh, especially it's toxic to the younger children because their teeth are developing so especially at around seven so here nine four under 14 92 percent hardly uh, fluorosis of some sort in the other uh, clinic in Egerton, it shows that um, the under 14 was uh, the prevalence was around, was actually at 100 percent so all the kids there had uh, fluorosis of some sort but in the adults, the pre prevalence was 79 to 49. So this is a number of things, which of course, as uh, you require some biochemists and uh, uh, medical personnel to be able to explain what exactly is going, but there are a number of factors. Some people move into the area um, uh, later on to work. So you might find that the exposure is low, especially when they came in as adults. But in a place where if children gr grow up there, then they get the, um, th they uh, absorb more of the fluoride. So here I'm just going back again to show that uh, from the results, we basically were able to distinguish um, what, what is happening. We have, of course, the area is also rich in, uh, I mean, the area is also arid. So we could see some cases where the fluoride uh, levels are high because of the evaporation component. And other cases, we also had this uh, dissolution or just uh, the ge geogenic source because fluoride is also not it, um, the major cause here. We think it is the rocks, but there are other factors as well that could increase the fluoride concentration. And on the uh, right, this picture, I just put it here for you to see. It's, it's very interesting because this is one of the areas that we found very high fluoride. And what is happening here is that people are actually tapping water from geothermal steam. So it's an area that doesn't have um, much rain. So as you see this, uh, there's a little pipe coming from the ground, which is vertical. You can't really see it because it's been blocked by the person. Then you have this round uh, cylinder and then all these tall pipes. So what happens is that the steam goes up, gets into this big cylinder and it's inclined in a way, some of the steam go up all the way towards the end, but uh, along this pipe, it cools, yeah? So it cools and then they collect the water further down there. So it's uh, uh, a very interesting way of get, gathering water and somehow within a night they are able to get around uh, 100 liters which people are going to share and there's quite a lot of them in this particular place. So that is one case of fluoride. So I am uh, now just moving again to another study which uh, I did in the coast and this was uh, together with a master's student uh, in here within uh, the coast of Kenya. The idea of this particular uh, study came uh, while, okay, I was there once doing uh, some, as an intern, and we realized that the problem of getting, I mean, the, the water problem was such a, a, an issue here. And as you can see, this lady, who is trying to get water from um, 
hand dug well, which is about two meters or so. And this is also an area which has some base metal. So there's some sort of mining going on and then people have to wait for water like this. So we were interested in trying to find out because we know this is the area with the base metals, uh, wanted to find out how are the heavy metals. So it was a bigger study with heavy metals in general and uh, trying to see um, uh, what are the concentrations in the soils, the plants, crops that are eaten in the area and also um, the water. And we also wanted to get the health component. So this one was a collaboration between us at the University of Nairobi, uh, University of Joburg and uh, Kilifi Welcome Trust. And these rocks, as I've shown in the insert photo here, uh, these sedimentary rocks, we basically, the blue unit here is a limestone. The others are majorly sandstones that we have around. And uh, the white dots are places where we sample the soils and the size of the dot actually shows the concentration of uh, lead that we found in the area. So lead ranges from these uh, below, very few areas had below detection limit and um, all the way to 370 uh, uh, ppm. And um, so, uh, what that is that, what we found is that 20% of the soils exceed the WHO limit. So if you look on the map on the right hand side, uh, from 20 is about the orangish uh, unit. So the orangish towards the reddish unit, those ones are, have um, higher um, lead, concentration and it's also related to the area, uh, if I go back, the area, if you look at this figure on the right, you see some red dots in here. Let me just get up there. So here we have some of these reddish dots. These are some of the areas that are actually are being mined, yeah? So, and you'll see that also the, uh, concentrations of uh, lead are higher within that particular unit. Then we collected like uh, four different crops which are eaten in the area. So we had the cassava, we had maize, we had cowpeas and also the uh, baobab pod, which is much uh, bigger. And what we found is that actually all the plants that we analyzed, the levels were above WHO recommended limits for leafy vegetables, uh, cereal grains, and tubers. And this just uh, goes to point that um, when you live in an area like this, or when people live in an area like this, that the soils have high uh, lead, then the crops that they're eating, which is grown nearby, has this high uh, inorganic elements. And then also the waters also have high, you see that the exposure is definitely high. <clears throat> so uh, let's go. And for this, because lead is one of those elements that is known to uh, impact on the brain of uh, the, to cause, cause some neurodevelopmental disease of, in uh, children mostly, but also in adults. And I think that, and actually that is why um, the non-leaded fuel was introduced because uh, the idea was to reduce the load of lead <clears throat> to the kids. And if you look at this particular map, what it shows is uh, based on the thesis of one of my students. Um, we have again the lead in the circles shown and the size of the circle is corresponding to the, the amount of lead. And then we have this uh, orange, well, beige to orange color. And this shows the 
prevalence of neurodevelopment diseases. And this was a, a, a data which was carried out by Kemri Kilifi. It's a medical research institution. And this is based on work that they had already done. So we were not able to go directly to uh, take or measure uh, the kids, but they had already done it. So what we did is to try and overlay the two uh, based on our work and their work. And um, we could say the following, that the neurodevelopmental uh, prevalence in six to nine year olds are higher. Uh, uh, prevalence in six to nine year olds are higher and uh, the lead concentrations correlate with this high uh, NDD prevalence. So we have these three areas, Zaini, Sokoke, Chashimba at 64, 63 and around 56 per, uh, uh, what is it called? Per hundred, a thousand for people. Yeah, so the count and the, the, the statistics these statistics are put by a thousand people. So these findings just highlight a possible link, yeah, of chronic lead toxicity in uh, Kilifi residents. But of course, we have other etiological factors, other factors that could uh, cause. Normally, in the area, they believe that eating. Some people believe that eating a lot of cassava somehow causes. Uh, um, some mental issues. So this is like the myth around, yeah? And it's not really far because we could actually see the tubers also like the cassava that we took had some level of uh, uh, lead in, in, in it. Okay, and then um, the final uh, study is uh, something that is still ongoing. Um, this is a study that uh, we are still gathering more information on. It's on the Western side of Kenya. And this is looking at uh, an area that does gold mining. And what we were interested in at the beginning was to look at the preterm birth. So, or it's called what premature, yeah, the birth outcomes. So kids who come earlier than um, uh, their time. And we were partnered with uh, also Kemri, the head office that had the data of all the preterm births. And uh, we visited the homes and to try to get the soil from the area and also and measure them, but also try to find out their history. Yeah? Especially if somebody was there just the last two, what a very short time period, we would uh, remove those ones, yeah? So we just wanted to find out who are the people who have lived there, the mothers who have lived there for a while and what did they find? And uh, that was with the uh, preterm birth. And connected to that is an element called selenium. And selenium also has a range which uh, is required uh, within the body and above, then it is toxic. So we took a number of samples and uh, we found that uh, the majority of the samples here have very low selenium. So usually the thing with low selenium is that it exposes the people to a lot of diseases. Yeah? So it's been mentioned in HIV and AIDS cases. It's been mentioned in uh, uh, several cancers, yeah. So we wanted to find out. And as we can see that from the samples we took, almost 71% of them has low uh, selenium in it. And we, yeah, and one key thing to mention is that it occurs in various forms in more than 50 minerals and soils in different forms, either as the elemental selenium, selenide, selenite, selenate, or organic selenium. In acidic soils, uh, they promote absorption of selenium to particles of clay and iron oxides or oxyoxides. So usually the acidic soils tend to have lower concentrations of selenium, while the alkaline ones will have high concentrations of selenium. And this is the acidic soils are actually what we have in this place, so where we have these granites. 
So uh, rocks which are rich in silica, like granites, form soils that have low concentrations of selenium, while the mafic or ultramafic form soils of relatively high uh, concentrations. This is not my study. It's another study that was done by other, another group, Ngigi, at OWL 2020. What I just want to show you here is that uh, they estimate about 90% of individuals being uh, at risk of a selenium deficiency uh, because they do not meet the estimated daily intake. Yeah. So this was from what um, a study that they did in the central part of Kenya. So um, the deficiency in selenium or mineral in soil can usually manifest as a human disease. We have a lot of diseases such as anemia, diabetes, cancers, disorders, and, uh, of liver, pancreas, etc. East Africa is known to be high in this esophageal cancer. So esophageal sarcoma cell sarcoma. And um, because the soils are known to have very low uh, selenium. And there's a study which was done by Pritchett in 2017. And he was able to show that the esophageal cancer was actually associated with the low selenium concentrations. Other studies have also shown um, uh, impact on uh, livestock because they also uh, take uh, selenium. They also require selenium for proper uh, bodily uh, function. So in essence, um, what uh, these three studies, I look at my time, I think I am just there. So there's one quick one, but I think I might have to skip that in the interest of time. Um, what I'd like to just uh, conclude with this is that we see that there's an impact of geology and health. Yeah, so this is initial. We need more studies to be able to make the connection. Yeah, uh, it's clear that we have areas with high, uh, either an excess or a deficiency in an element or so. So the next thing is to be able to carry out these studies that are able to associate certain health outcomes with a geological environment. So that means there's more research that is needed. And of course, with this cannot be done by only geologists, but we need people in the public health. We need geo, uh, geochemists, we need geologists, we need other health practitioners, water providers, ETC. But we also need capacity building, yeah, so that uh, certain uh, out health outcomes that are actually associated with the uh, deficiency or an excess of a certain element can be identified as so. I have a story for that if I have time later. And there's also need for an awareness creation. I think also just the locals need to understand um what are some of the deficiencies that they need to make up for or if there's an excess what are a, some remediation activities that can be done so that's a whole other topic and then of course there's need for interdisciplinary collaborations and uh, also just uh, different kinds of partnerships both locally and also internationally there are also other elements of concern. They've been mentioned here and there. There's arsenic, cobalt, iodine. Uh, I think I've covered selenium. There's also, uh, what I didn't cover is the aluminum, iron, and silica. And then also the um, mercury, because some of these studies which are neglected or called tropical neglected diseases, some of them are actually related with the environment. So I'm going to stop there. and. Um, I know I have not really um, uh, gone into details of um, all the, uh, what is it called? The um, concentrations of the rocks and the soils and all this, but this was just a broad overview to um, create an appetite on this particular interesting topic, which has uh, implications in many 
areas uh, which are not so uh, developed. It is different for areas that are, well, uh, that are developed because their food comes from another place. Yeah, so the food, the water is imported, everything is imported and not really from uh, where they live. And then also there's a lot of fortification of different foods. So some of these health outcomes don't really show up the way they show in the areas that are not so well developed or in rural areas. So thank you very much for your time. I am going to stop there and I can welcome any questions. Thank you very much, Lydia. It was really fantastic, uh, fantastic talk. I really appreciate it. Uh, I opened the podium for uh, questions from the audience. Um, I don't I think that. Yeah, there the, are some on the, the chat. I don't know if I should read or I should. Yeah, read. yeah. Uh, the question is uh, that you have measured uh, lead in soil and crops. Did you see any biomagnification in the lead concentration in the crop? Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Pacha, um, ve very um, interesting. What we found um, to be a bit high, you know, because uh, there, there's a number of things which we still need to um, control this for, yeah? We measured the in crops that they eat. We just wanted to find out the exposure, yeah? However, uh, we do, we looked at uh, the leaves of cowpeas. This is a crop that grows within three months. We also looked at baobab that can live up to 50 to 100 years, eh? the pod. So it wasn't the leaf. Then we looked at the cassava, which also has a different range. Then there was maize, which is also in a couple of months. Eh? So the idea was just exposure. But of course, as you say, magnification, this is like the next kind of study that can spin out of this uh, particular study to be able to understand the biomagnification. And also because we looked at different heavy metals, but here I only uh, mentioned lead. Um, when you look at the way uh, the different plants, somehow when they have a lead, a toxic thing, some put in the leaves, others put in the flowers, others put in the roots. So it's really different. Yeah? So those are some of the things which we didn't really uh, collect for. We didn't correct for. We were basically just looking at the what is it, how much are they taking? But of course, it's there. The next step, we need to understand those kinds of things because they are the plant have different ways of uh, taking an element that is non-essential and how it, where it keeps it in different places. But we could see within the cassava, of course, we had higher concentration because it's the root. And if a plant like a cowpea, which is only the leaves that is being taken, keeps it in the roots, okay? So the exposure when the people eat the leaves is less. So we didn't do this kind of a characterization of this plant, what, how much is in the root, how much is in the stem and the, the leaves. So th th that's an open area for study. Oh, I have a question. Yeah, the, well, yeah go ahead, whoever has a question. Uh, um, besides uh, eating food that is not locally grown, does the government have other solutions for these issues like uh, treatment of the water or something like that? I don't know, <laughs> or not at all. I think the government needs the evidence that there's a problem <laughs> then <laughs> fast, then now they can move to the next step. So I think um, actually, if you look at the, um, uh, when we were, of course, this was uh, thesis done in 2017, and I think the proposal was written like in 2012. So at that time, the the genogenic component was not being studied. Actually, has really not been looked at. However, there's another big case of lead pollution from a battery mining big battery manufacturer. That's a much bigger problem. I think the focus is more on that side as compared to this side. Yeah. So this is just a rural community that people take water and take all these things really not knowing. So I think this is basically building the evidence or the case for an intervention. So far, nothing is done. 
Thank you. <laughs> there is a question from the chat um, from John. Uh, you mentioned mining in the Western region of Kenya. Is there a higher concentration of heavy metals in the groundwater in the region? Yes, John. Um, yeah, this is a, a thing that we have very, very fresh results. And um, there is mining in the Western region has been done here since I think 18 something by the British. So then they mined until around 1950s and then stopped. Yeah, so there were all these uh, ground uh, underground mines, open pit mines, blah, 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 all the things. And then now people have come in and are doing some artisanal work. So when we've uh, been doing the study, you find certain pockets where you have high concentrations of certain metals really extremely high in groundwater in one place and then the other one not. So it's actually one of the things which we are trying to connect together with the geophysics to be able to map the aquifers very well to see what is going on. Because when the miners go down, maybe like about uh, 10 or 20 meters deep, they always encounter the groundwater and then they pump it out. So for example, we have a case where <clears throat> I was in the field three weeks ago and I saw the, uh, we went to a place and we met with a, a case of um, keratosis. So, you know, when uh, people have taken arsenic, then their skin changes, yeah? So we just saw this. And when we asked, the borehole was drilled in 2020. So within a year, <laughs> they've had this. And it's only isolated. We haven't seen it in any other place because we sampled in 2019 there. Of course, there are two, three places which were high, but this is like a thousand times higher than what we found in the area. So I think all these unmapped tunnels which are in there and pockets of arsenopyrites and, and uh, different kinds of rocks, they have high concentrations of, we've also seen lead, which is high, cobalt, Copper is really high in uh, areas where they're mining copper as well. So, and chromium. So just little pockets. We haven't really come up with at which, in which aquifer, which depth, what's the process that is going on. So it's some work which is ongoing and we are working with the British Geological Survey on this. Let anyone speak. Uh, okay. go uh, yeah, go ahead, Gabriel. Please. Oh. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I was wondering. I was... Yeah, uh, well done, uh, Doctor. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's a great job you are doing. Uh, I speak with reference to uh, the, 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 you make reference to the, the location being a rural area uh, where you took some of your samples. And I wanted to ask uh, if, you know, again, the issue with anthropogenic uh, impact or geogenic impact. But uh, aside these two major issues, is there any other way, I mean, things you observe, you observe could be the reason for high flow, flowing content, as you mentioned in some of the water or the iron contents? Is, uh, is there... The, okay. From the fluoride, of course, we, me we measured the rocks, yeah? So this is known to be high. And it's, it's I mean, the, the other thing that I think can always introduce is a fertilizer, I think, yeah? So that's, yeah, fertilizer or nearness to the ocean. So when you have like a spray from the ocean water and all these kinds of things, but of course this is much inland, so we don't expect that. Uh, I think I'm also analyzed some rainwater. I forget how much I got there. But I don't think it was such a significant component. And um, so we think majorly is the geogenic aspect. And then, I mean, if there's any other thing that is introducing fluoride, it could be from the anthropogenic, but that would be a smaller bit. Eh? Then I think with the fertilizer, what did we do? I think we also looked at fertilizer and nitrate. 
Yeah, I mean, we also looked at fluoride and nitrate to see whether um, if we think it's fertilizer, then probably the nitrate should also be high. You know, it should correlate in some way or another. But I don't think that was very significant, yeah? Because I've also done other work with strontium and it's still not really a very strong uh, factor, the anthropogenic uh, bit of it. Oh, there's also the, the other one is called what? Um, volcanism. Yeah, so if you have all this volcanic ash and yes. yeah, which are in the area, and that is an, an area with a lot of volcanic formations and also the ash from, I think 3000 years ago from the volcanoes around the region. Eh? So it's strewn around that area. And these are the ones that are being reworked into the sediments and forming this sort of alluvial, uh, these uh, lacustrine sediments that you saw in that area. So it's sort of like a sediment, but from a volcanic origin. Eh? So just concentrates the fluoride. Oh, oh, okay, thank you. Because I just wanted to make a quick uh, catch on that, that uh, some of these things, like you said, uh, are regional based or locality based. And uh, just a reference to Professor Davis, you mentioned, uh, he taught me when I was in just in Nigeria is a oh, professor too. Okay. Okay, <laughs> so yeah. There are some work actually in, uh, in just Plateau that are actually influenced by the industrial environment, which is as a result of the fertilizer. And just again is actually a, an environment that was influenced by the younger granite volcanic eruption, which mm. actually increased the, the melter content of the water in some of the environment. And if you leave this area and you go to Lagos, away from uh, the north in Nigeria, the water uh, composition, metal content and others are far, far below. So, mm -hmm. I mean, this has, I mean, I'm not a geochemist, but I know these are some of the work they did with uh, United Nations. And mm -hmm. uh, they spent a lot of years working on this with some other professors. So. Uh, the fertilizer is key because if you go down to an industrial environment and mm. down the stream, this uh, all the rain, everything just washes down the stream, and the people keep taking them, and they mm. don't need the reason for their sickness and health. So, yeah. thank you very much. It's a nice presentation. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody else has questions? <clears throat> Well, just want to say thank you. <laughs> Your research um, is absolutely phenomenal. I think the, the linkage, um, seeing all the, the, obviously the relationship between geology and health um, and the complications of it as well. I, I, I'm, I, I have many questions, you know, particularly if we say geology and health, but of course the anthropogenic of disruptions due to mining and how that exacerbates the situation that perhaps, you know, if it's, if, if you remove that from the equation, you know, the, the health might, um, the health effects would, you know, naturally be quite different. So um, mm -hmm. I think uh, it's a really important and fascinating work. So glad to hear it directly mm -hmm. from you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think we are we are done. Thank you very much, Lydia. I really appreciate very much. It was really fascinating um, hosting you, and I hope that uh, we will be able to to not host you only virtually, but also also to to, to meet. Okay. Yeah. Sure. In Israel. In Israel. Okay. Bye bye. Everybody. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank yeah. You. And please let Thank me you. know if you want to stay in touch with us for the next uh, seminars. Yeah, I'd love to. I would love to. Okay, great. Yes. I will do. Thank you. Okay. Have a good yeah, day. Bye. Bye. Good bye. day. Bye.